Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. And uh, a welcome and good morning to any visitors and any of you who are from afar watching or listening, listening in. Well, if you're dropping in today, uh, we have been uh, making our way through our purpose statement, taking three Sundays to uh, refresh and review <clears throat> what our purpose statement says and what the scriptures call us to be as uh, the church of the Lord Jesus. We hope to reignite your passion for being the church, uh, being the people of God as he has made us to be. And we also want to use these three weeks to um, communicate or share with you just some of our thoughts, some of our prayers arising out of our, our uh, annual elders planning and prayer retreat, which just took place a few weeks back. Uh, let me once again just quote to you our, our purpose statement. Our purpose statement says that we, as a church, we exist to magnify the glory of God through Jesus Christ in all things. Uh, by responding to his grace in worship, that was week one, we focused on corporate worship. By applying his grace in discipleship, and that was last Sunday if you were here. And then lastly, by extending his grace in mission. And that's what our theme is this morning, revisiting our mission as a church, extending the grace of God through mission. Uh, of course, mission <clears throat> involves evangelism. It's not only evangelism, but certainly it includes it. And as I share with the first hour, sometimes when we, we bring up the topic of evangelism, just like prayer, uh, some of you kind of look down, look away, because <laughs> we don't pray as we ought, and we aren't sharing the gospel as we ought. But that, that, that applies to all of us. And beloved, I want to remind you that repentance is part of the Christian life, and it is a gift of grace to be made aware of ways that God intends and desires for you to live better as a Christian. And so let that be your, 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 your focus today, if somehow the Lord presses upon you, you haven't been communicating the truth, uh, this is a great Sunday to seek his grace and mercy, know that he's ready to receive you, help you, and strengthen you, and the Lord's Supper would be a good, a good context for that. So let me read from a few passages, just like the other Sundays, uh, I, I'm not going to focus on one passage and, and bring an exposition of just one passage. So let me read from Matthew chapter 5 as we begin. Uh, the passage there at the end of the Beatitudes about the salt and light. Jesus says to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. This is Matthew 5, 13. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now I'll add to that from the Gospel of John, after the resurrection Another appearance of Christ to the disciples in the upper room. He manifests himself there in John chapter 20. And he said to them, verse 21, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And then turning also to the book of Acts in chapter 1. After that time of his resurrection, the Lord appeared to his disciples on and off over a period of 40 days. And then on the day of his ascension, um, he spoke with the disciples and answered a question. They asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. And then he made this statement, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their 
sight, and our Lord ascended to the right hand of the Father. In God's providence, today is Ascension Sunday. Uh, Thursday was the Ascension in the church calendar, and God in His gracious guidance and providence allowed us to be on this theme uh, on this Lord's Day. So this ends the reading of God's Word. I pray that the Lord will bless it to all your hearts, those listening and following wherever you are. Now, when we speak about uh, mission of the church, uh, we're talking about something that is very central to uh, our calling. In fact, it's been said that the church is the only institution that exists for the sake of its (laughs) non-members. Now, that may be an overstatement, to be sure. There are other things we exist for, but it's not far from the truth, you know, that we do exist to be salt and light uh, to the world and to extend the good news. And it rightly elevates, I think, that statement, the priority of mission. And when we talk about mission, I'm not speaking about a missions department led by a few people. I'm not talking about an evangelism team. Uh, we tend to think sometimes when, when we hear mission as something that some of us organize for the rest of us, you know. But it's much, much more than that, beloved. It's mission is something we are and something we are all the time, 24-7. Doing what we're supposed to do flows from what we are. And what we are is the salt and light of the earth. The Lord Jesus, you heard me read, he did not say become the salt or become the light. He said you are the salt. You are the light. As salt, he says, I've left you here in this fallen, broken world, a world that's in a process of disintegration, a world that's in a process of falling to pieces in governments, relationships, even our bodies, in this broken, disintegrating world, you are a preserving element. (laughs) You have an influence, and you are the light of the world. Uh, Just your very presence in the world, if we live true to who we are, will show light in the darkness. It doesn't take but a small little flicker of a candle in a room that's pitch black to give light. And so when we are talking about mission, again, we're not talking about only some organized group who does some things for us, but we're talking about uh, being true to what God has made us to be. And think back on our series in 1 Peter. 1 Peter, in chapter 2, he says, you are a spiritual household. And what he's saying, he says, God is building a temple, a household, not out of mortar and bricks and stone, but out of people. He's building a temple out of people in which he dwells. And he has made you his people priests. We are priests, he says, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So what we are supposed to be doing always flows from what God has made us to be. And what we are is his mission. Because we are his salt, we are his light, we are his feet, his hands, and we are his lips in this world, right? And when our passion, I find this, when our passion for myself to be true, when our passion for souls, when our passion for people who live captivated in that darkness of this disintegrating world, when our passion for those people who are lost diminishes or maybe even begins to die, I find, I find that our, our sense, my sense of the reality of spiritual things diminishes right along with it, you say. Because maybe I'm not believing this is real, you know. Maybe I'm not believing it's true today. And so this is a very important topic for us, beloved, Uh, Lots is at stake. Let me share with you this morning three affirmations about our mission, mission as the church. And the first affirmation is that our mission, the mission, right, is a mission fulfilling God's redemptive purposes. It is 
fulfilling God's redemptive purposes. Let me explain what that means here. Uh, John R. Mott, that's Mott with an M, not Stott with an S, he wrote and he said, the evangelization of the world is not man's enterprise, but God's. <laughs> God's. Christ at the right hand of God is the leader of the missionary movement, and with him resides all power in heaven and on earth. That's a vision we need to have about, quote, the mission. God is a missionary God. What is he doing? He is fulfilling his great plan. What plan? Plan of redemption, his plan of restoration. The plan to recreate this falling world, the plan to restore a fallen humanity, the plan to once again dwell amongst the people in deep and profound communion and fellowship. This is God's plan, you see. God's on a mission. <laughs> and this is his mission, his plan of redemption. And all of that is rooted in his covenant promises down through the ages. It's, it's a picture, I think, that we need, that we are involved in something very big, large, eternal, when we talk about the mission. You know, in the books of Acts, in chapter 3, after the Spirit had come upon Peter, and he found himself there preaching in the power of the Spirit, in Acts chapter 3, it's recorded in verse 24, he was talking, he said, all the prophets who have spoken, all of them, from Samuel and those who came after him, also proclaimed these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, speaking to the Jewish audience. Then he said, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring or in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. You see, the Abrahamic covenant, right? And this is what's happening. This is the age in which we live. The Son has come into the world to die, to be our Passover lamb, to take upon himself our guilt and sin, to satisfy the Father's justice, to be raised from the dead, to ascend to his right hand, pour out his Spirit on the people of God, and now to the end of the age, fulfill all the plans of God and what he spoke through the prophets of bringing a blessing to all the nations, right, you see, all peoples. That, you see, that's what we're involved in. And we got to get a sense of that. It gives us a sense of purpose and the fact that what we're doing is big, very, very big. Mission, therefore, it's God's doing. I read a book uh, on and off throughout this week, again, remembering this topic uh, by C.J. Miller, C. John Miller, who's now with the Lord. He wrote a book. It's now entitled Powerful Evangelism for the Powerless. I go back to it at a time when I when I feel that sense of weakness. And he writes in there, he says, following Christ into the harvest field is not an enterprise for the faint-hearted or the half-persuaded. We need the strongest assurance that our work is not self-generated, but that our believing is hooked into what God is doing in history. <laughs> And then he goes on to say, that is why God has revealed himself to us in Scripture as the sovereign missionary. God, you see, beloved, has a plan for the ages, the fullness of times, the book of Ephesians says, to sum up all things under Christ. And, and our living in this world as salt and light, our fulfilling uh, our calling to make disciples, to preach the gospel, is us being a part of what God is doing. So be fully assured, don't be half persuaded that we didn't come up with this, Paul didn't come up with this, this is not some sort of, some sort of uh, you know, religious idea that someone fabricated. This is the very plan of God. This is the narrative that explains all human history. Creation, fall, redemption, consummation, and we live in that time of bringing in who, those whom God has redeemed for his glory, and we await the time of consummation. Every, every Christian needs to be reminded of this, that we are tied into, hooked into, as Miller says, what God is doing in the world. Even the great apostle Paul, you know, who was a great evangelist, 
Uh, he himself found himself at times needing the encouragement of the Lord. When he came to the town of Corinth, the book of Acts records that he had suffered there. He was overwhelmed. And when he wrote to the church at Corinth, he said, I came into your city in fear and trembling. And he found himself pulling back and pulling away and feeling afraid. And the book of Acts records in chapter 18, verse 9, that the Lord appeared to him. And it said, the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid. But go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. They already are my people. I have many. I'm sending you to bring them in, you see. Who's in charge here? Who's in control? It's not, this, it's not the officials of the city of Corinth. It's God. It's Christ. He needed that encouragement. Later, Paul was arrested in Jerusalem for preaching the gospel there to, again, the Jewish people. And there was a moment when it looked like they were going to tear him to pieces, and that's how Luke records it. And so they pulled Paul out of that milieu of violence, and then the Lord spoke to him yet again in Acts chapter 23, verse 24. The Lord appeared to Paul Excuse me, yeah, let me find the right place. 23, verse 11. It says that the following night, the Lord stood by him, stood by Paul, and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. You will. You will testify in Rome. No one can stand in God's way. Who's in control here? There are nations and governments in this world that say we are closing our borders to Christians, closing our borders to the gospel, to missionaries. Do you think that stops the purposes of God? Well, not at all, you see. And so we need to be reminded that being on mission, living aware that we are the salt and light of the earth and being in mission is being tied into what God is doing in this world, fulfilling his great purposes. And that, I think, what it does, it breeds in us a sense of expectancy, a sense of expectancy that there could be fruit. <laughs> there can be fruit. Why? Well, I have many in this city, Paul was told, and you will testify to me in Rome and so forth. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Paul would write to that church at Rome. For it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And you begin to have a sense of expectancy. This is power. There's the power of, of saving grace. In 1 Corinthians, he wrote to that very church again at Corinth, in which he trembled. And he said, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is what? The power of God. Oh, and I thought it was foolishness once, twice, three, four, five times my friends came to me. More than that. But one day, beloved, it came as the power of God and opened my eyes and I received the forgiveness of sins. And so mission is what God is doing in history. And as we live alert and awake, we remind ourselves that we are part of something very, very, very big. And when we lose our passion or, or we face setbacks, we, are, we must be reminded we are not on a fool's errand. This is not something Tony came up with. We are on an errand for the living God, and he has his purposes. You know, this last week, we, the church lost a great evangelist of our times, and that was Pastor Tim Keller, who went to be with the Lord in glory just a couple days ago. He spoke a lot about mission, and we may quibble with him here and there on things he said, but he was certainly a man who was central, centralized on the gospel and bringing that gospel news to others. And he wrote on mission a lot, and what he said he once was, what's mission? He says, to be on mission is to be living for a cause that's more important than your own comfort in life, so that you're willing to sacrifice. That's living on mission, he said. It's to live your life for a cause that you sacrifice your needs and conveniences for. Why? Because the cause is more important than even yourself. <laughs> because it's the, what? The cause of God. This is what God is doing in the world, bringing in a people from every nation, tribe, and tongue to be a part of the family of God. So we need to buy in to what's happening here. And you think about what happens when people face sacrifice for the sake of the cause, they need to believe in it. 
They need to be convinced of it. You know, I don't really know what's going on in Ukraine. I'm not sure how many of us really know all the facts of what's happening on the ground there. But one thing I have been reading, God knows how true it is, is how some of these uh, Russian soldiers have been leaving in droves. Why? Because they don't buy in to the cause. Why should I lay down my life for this? Why are we here? What are we doing? Some of them say. They don't believe in it, you see. And so the first affirmation is that mission, our mission is fulfilling the grand redemptive purposes of God. And the question is, are we living simply for the immediate or are we living for something that we are willing to sacrifice for? Something bigger than our individual lives and our own comfort zone. Now, the second affirmation is that our mission is a mission not only fulfilling God's redemptive purposes, but embracing God's gracious promises. It's a mission that is embracing God's precious promises. It is experiencing God's gracious promises. You know, God stimulates our faith. He knows we need stimulus. The Lord knows we need motivation. Just as he came to, to, to Paul on those two occasions and spoke to him, God knows we motiv- need motivation, and he gives us great promises to undergird us, to give us hope and to, to sustain us in our witness in this world. To quote uh, C. John Miller again, he said, to strengthen our convictions of what? That God is the sovereign missionary, okay? To strengthen our convictions that this is God's enterprise, the Lord has expressed his missionary concern in the form of great promises of grace. Great promises of grace. These promises assure us Assure us, listen to this, of the omnipotence of God's grace. The omnipotence of God's grace. That he will accomplish what he has promised. And so he gives us these promises. He reminds us of these gracious promises that we might not only understand that we're involved in something big, but be encouraged and motivated by the fact that God has promised he will do something, that he will work. What kinds of promises? Well, the old covenant, of course, is filled with them. The promises of a, that he will uh, bring about a salvation that includes peoples from all nations. But what about promises that came from the Lord Jesus and his own lips? Well, think about these. Think about John chapter 10 and that chapter of the good shepherd as we refer to it. Think about these words that came from our Lord. Jesus said there, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. Verse 14, I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And listen to this. They will listen to my voice. They will. And so there will be one flock with one shepherd. (laughs) Then jumping down, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. What did Jesus say to Paul? I have many. I have many in this, I have in this city. I got scattered sheep all over this city. They need to hear my voice, but they'll hear my voice off your lips, you see, in their heart and their conscience. So keep going, Paul. There's a promise to reflect upon. What about the promise in, in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 10 that the harvest is plentiful? That God intends to save many people. The problem is what? That the laborers are few. What about that great vision in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, 9, where it says there that the elect of God, yes, the sheep of of, of the good shepherd, they are a multitude that no man can even count. Doesn't that give you hope? (laughs) A multitude no one could add up. (laughs) It was so gloriously grand in that vision that was given to the apostle John. And so, and then there are all the promises given to the patriarchs, again, centuries ago, uh, of, of God's desire and plan to reach the nations, as I've already mentioned them. And Paul repeats them in Romans 15 and so forth. And then there's the promise of, of the Holy Spirit. The promise that Christ will be with with us even to the end of the age. And he's with us by indwelling us through his very spirit. 
that the Spirit would join us in the mission and get, bring the power that is necessary in us and in those who hear us, that the Spirit would come to fulfill these things. These are all the promises of God that I'd like you to, to think about and reflect about. You know, in John 16, the, the, the Lord spoke to those disciples. We're anticipating his departure, and he told them that he was going to send them a comforter, one who would be like him. Then he said, and when he comes, verse 8, he, he the Spirit of God, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me concerning righteousness because I go to the father and you will see me no longer concerning judgment because the ruler of the world is judged I still have many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now when the spirit of truth comes he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own authority but whatever he hears he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come he will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you you see now that promise you see that promise is a promise that had some specific fulfillment for those apostles. I understand that. But the Spirit is still at work, and the Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, and He came to convict of sin, and He still does. If you're a Christian, at some point in your life, the Spirit convicted you of your need to be reconciled and forgiven, your need for cleansing from the guilt of your sin. That was the work of the Spirit, you see. Now listen, he is still with us, empowering us, giving power to God's word and giving power to those who share that word. And he is still convicting of people of sin, leading people into the truth. And he is still glorifying Christ, showing Christ, shining a light on Christ, revealing to people the glory of who he is, that he is the son of God in the flesh that he came to endure uh, uh, the punishment for their sin. This becomes personalized to these people and that he was raised from the dead. And as Peter said in 1 Peter 1, remember, though you have not seen him and still you don't see him now, you love him. <laughs> and why do you love him? Because the Spirit has convicted you of sin and led you into truth. <laughs> and he has shown you the reality that the gospel is real. That's the only hope we have, you see. You and I won't, uh, you know, won't uh, talk people into the kingdom by the power of our logic. We will speak the truth, and what will happen? God will save. Uh, the Lord will bring in his sheep. And so uh, it's a mission that embraces God's gracious promises. And I think we need to be convinced of that, you know, and, and remember that and move forward and what we think may be our weakness because I know sometimes you feel like I don't know how to answer all their questions well, that's okay we don't have to answer all the questions you know sharing Christ doesn't mean answering all of life's philosophical questions it means sharing Christ so you don't need to get to all those things and I know you feel maybe timid uh, but I want to tell you that he will meet with you in the hour in which you decide to speak going back to see John Miller he says as we go with his gospel our part is to discover his strength in the presence of our incapacity. <laughs> discover his strength in the presence of our incapacity. And he says it's that combination, that combination of our weakness claiming his strength that causes the word of grace to run and be glorified. He's referring to a verse in 2 Thessalonians. So you can't discover God's strength except when you step out in weakness. In other words, you can't wait for the strength before you step out. But as you step out in weakness, saying, I'm not sure I know how to put this right. I'm not sure where to start. I'm not sure what they're going to think. I'm not sure how to respond. And, but you step out in weakness, and you discover God's strength, that he is sufficient to help you bring the truth of the gospel before others, that he may be glorified. So all of these promises and more, beloved, invite us to do what? To believe, to trust. Trust what? That this is God's plan. Trust what? That God loves 
sinners of all stripes, from all walks of life, from all ethnicities, from all levels of wickedness, that God has a love, that he is, he is the one fully committed to this. And how do we know he's committed to this? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, what more could he show us to convince us that he's in this? <laughs> and we're, you know, we're hitching our wagon to him. <laughs> and he's, he is the one who has a heart for the lost and a heart for those who suffer in the darkness of this world. So it's a mission embracing God's gracious promises. Thirdly, it's also, beloved, a mission imitating God's suffering servant. And I turn to, to John 20 again for that. What do I mean by imitating? Uh, uh, in John 20, what the Lord said to them was, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. There is no command in there, no imperative, but the key words are as or just as. So, so also, just as the Father sent me, so also I am sending you. And the, the key to all this is the force of that little preposition, just as. Just as the Father sent me, I am sending you. And this is an expansion on what Jesus said in his great priestly prayer in John chapter 17. When there he said, to the Father, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And so when we say uh, that what this means, just as, it, it means that Christ's incarnational ministry of coming into this world is a model for our own. In other words, our mission is patterned after Christ, just as God sent him into the world, he has also now sent us into the world. And so we are to embody, beloved, we are to embody the same qualities characteristic of Jesus when he fulfilled his mission in this world. And what were some of those qualities? Well, there's so many. Uh, he was, his humble obedience, right? I came to do the Father's will. His submission to the Father's plan. Not my will be done, but yours, right? His, uh, we have the same purpose that he had, which was what? To glorify the Father through the salvation of others. Now, of course, his mission, achieve the salvation of others. But our mission is to what? To report that salvation. To herald it. To announce, to declare to a, a world in darkness that Christ has come that all can be well if they turn to him. He was raised to, from the dead. There is more to life than what you're experiencing right now, you see. So that's our mission. It mimics his. It is patterned after this. And it's also patterned in the sense that we, our mission, which is an extension of his, is taking place in the same sphere, which is where? This world. This world. You say, this world? <laughs> We are sent into this world, this crazy world, the spirit that's cycling and spinning out of control. Absolutely. This messy, upside down world where good is now called evil and evil is called good. Yes, we're sent to this world. Remember how many times the book, the Gospels show that, record that Jesus met with the outcasts of the world. He met with those who were thought the worst of sinners just as much as he met with those who saw themselves as being righteous before others. Jesus went wherever the Father willed him to go. He didn't suffer from snobbery. He went to the poor as well as to the rich. He went into, into tough situations as well as easier situations. And if our, if our mission is to be models after his, we need to not fully withdraw from this messy, dark world. And that's a problem for many Christians today. I find it. I find that one of the things that's happened over this pandemic, what's happened in the last couple of years, is not only have some Christians withdrawn from each other, but as, as they slowly become warmer to being with each other, they've withdrawn from the world. Why, some of you don't even have to go to work anymore. <laughs> you work from home. And you get more and more used to not being among those outsiders, among those who need the grace of God the most. And so, yes, there's, 
there's a whole lot of messiness out there. But listen, we don't have the luxury of checking out. We don't have the luxury of checking out. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. You don't put it under a bushel. You don't hide it, he says. You're like a city set on a hill. You need to be near enough for people to see a light. And, and so, yes, yes, I'm glad that the Lord sent someone to me who was stubborn and shared the gospel several times. Are you glad someone sent the light to you? <laughs> I'm glad I had friends who told me that I was a sinner and that I needed to give an account to God. I'm glad that my high school electronics teacher took me and my other band members out with hair down the back of our waist. And, you know, if it was today, I would have been tatted and pierced and wearing all black, you know. He took us out for pizza after school. And what did he do? He just talked to us about Christ. I'm glad. I'm glad my, my, my electronics professor wasn't freaked out about me. <laughs> And shared Jesus. And my friend shared Jesus. Yes, we've been sent into the world. This world, beloved. To share the gospel of Christ. I'm reminded uh, of some of the darkest places that I've been where the Lord has sent me, you know, playing, sharing my testimony on on Broadway in San Francisco and Mabuhay Gardens and on a night of a punk rock punk rock show. And they put us on the bill. I'm thinking, (laughs) they have no idea we're Christians, you know. (laughs) What are we going to do? I'm going to stand there and share my testimony. I remember sharing my testimony in, a, in, a, in, a, in another club uh, uh, up, up north of Santa Rosa. And I've shared with you before, when we got there, I, I realized what, a club, what kind of club it was because there was a, you know, a, a fence on the platform, on the stage, dividing the, the performers from the audience. I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> This is going to be wild. And so, yes, it's, it's being sent into the world. We don't have the luxury of checking out. It gets messy. It gets hard. You don't have to have all the, question, uh, all the answers to all the questions. Sometimes it could be exhausting. I was sharing with Sherry the other day. We had an HOA meeting, and I knew what it was going to be about because there, all the emails destroying each other came first, you know. And I knew this was what the HOA meeting was going to be about. And it, being there for three hours, I tell you, it was exhausting. Watching, hearing people just, you know, gossip about those who weren't there, attacking each other, being hostile about each other's opinions, and, and my trying to sh- somehow segue into, into better ideas and get to the gospel somehow. Came home to Sherry, said, I'm just drained. <laughs> it's exhausting. But this is the world. This is the world we've been sent into and the world that Christ came into and he sent someone to you, you see. So it's patterned. It's patterned after him. This is Ascension Sunday, as I said, and I think some Christians would like to ascend and get out of here right now. You know, why don't we just join him? (laughs) Well, we don't have that luxury. But we do have the glorious privilege of seeing miracles happen when we share the message of hope the message of Christ, you see. So let's reflect now then. Let's reflect a bit on this. Going into the world, uh, how is this done? Well, it happens both corporately. In other words, there are organized evangelistic events. It happens individually. It happens formally. Let's say when we say, hey, on Light Up Tonight and the Christmas, we're going to see if we can hand out tracts or have somebody share a testimony. Or it happens informally and ways when you interact with people. Going into the world might involve going somewhere, but for many of you, it just involves being aware of where you are already. <laughs> you're, you're, you're in the world. And as we reflected over, this, over our retreat, over what's happened over the last couple of years on, in regards to mission, on one level, when it came to international mission, we, we were praising God because we managed to stay on point through those two, three years. We managed to strongly support our mission partners across the world who were suffering in many cases worse than we. We managed to, during that time, to, to help and lead, in fact, the foundation of a Bible institute in Costa Rica for the training of church members and the training of pastors. All that happened under international mission during those darkest of times. And so we felt, praise God for what happened in that. But when it came to local mission, when it came to GBC being a light and salt here in our community and in the surrounding areas, that was much more difficult. There's a lot of ground that was lost, let's say. 
that we need to regain. It wasn't all bad. I mean, during that time as well, if you remember, when it comes to local mission, we, we were able to assist in many great ways with the, the planting of two churches. The church in Benicia, in which some of our members went. The church in Folsom. And we've been supporting and sending funds and, and so forth behind both of those church plans. That's part of local mission. So praise God, we stayed committed to that. And we again, we stayed on point. But when it came to both corporate events as a church and and trying to, to equip and energize you to event individually fulfill this calling. We feel like we took many steps back, you know. During that time, you remember in 2021, we lost uh, our local outreach leader when Ben left the state. And uh, to, he, he, what, he had functions such as coordinating some of our efforts and bringing together uh, teams, uh, motivating. He would teach on, on demand. He would teach classes on the gospel so people felt comfortable. We feel like as pastors, we need to build that up again. We need to restore that. We need to, we need to en encourage putting ourselves together and being alert and working together uh, on our local mission. Now, that's formalized. That's organizational. That's corporate. There's also local mission in these four walls, that's corporate. What do I mean by that? I mean that we want to remain alert to the fact that for whatever reason, God in his mercy and grace keeps bringing people into these four walls. Some of them from all kinds of nations across the world and people who are yet to be convinced about the gospel or who have questions. We praise God for that. And I could go down a list of some names, but I don't want to you know, put anybody on the spot. But I would say this, that we felt like we need to, we really need to improve our hospitality towards these people, our, our love towards these people, both on a coordinated level and an individual level. You know, the term hospitality in the New Testament means love for stranger, not hanging with your buddies, right? So hospitality in the New Testament is the capacity to open your heart, sacrificially your life, to strangers, showing hospitality. And that's an area I think we need to excel still more. How we might help you do that, that's another question that we still work and pray for that. But you think yourself on how you uh, might not stay so distant from the world, so distant from outsiders, so hidden from other people's problems, you know, so hidden and, and, and privatized because they're, they're, they're an issue, man, you know. And open your life and show Christian hospitality, which is love for strangers. There's a, I will say, without naming names, that there's a couple from the, that's come to our church in the last couple months who we believe, they believe, have come to faith. They barely speak our language. And part of it came about, you know how? When they were in another city before they moved here, someone showed them Christian love and opened their homes to someone who was a foreigner. And that got their attention. That blew them away. So there we need to grow uh, as a church. Uh, but the truth is, beloved, that when we gather, we gather primarily for the first two pillars, right? Our first two objectives, which are what? We gather to respond to his grace and worship. And we gather to what? Apply his grace in, in discipleship. In other words, we gather primarily to edify. Yes, we are aware, need to be aware that we're on mission even on Sundays. And how you talk to uh, people who you're not sure who they are is important, whether or not that you're being understandable or you're just using a lot of Christian cliche. So we understand that that's our primary goals when we gather and we scatter to fulfill the mission. We scatter to be salt and light in the earth. And so primarily, primarily, the mission of the church is fulfilled by individual Christians such as yourself who remain true to their nature as salt and light and are aware of their contacts and opportunities in the world and turn conversations into friendships, turn friendships into what? Gospel communication. Uh, hospitality. That's where it happens, you see. Again, to quote C.J. Miller, he said, the entire church is a commissioned body. 
the entire church. Think about this. You're fulfilling God's purposes, and God has chosen. God has chosen for, uh, in his mercy and his amazing love and his own wisdom, God has chosen you, not angels, you to be the sole agents by which his mercy will reach other human beings. Wow. It's both a privilege, it's awesome, and I know on one level you say it's intimidating, but remember, it's not you. <laughs> it, it, he is the chief missionary. You're a mouthpiece. He's the savior. He's the enlightener. He's the awakener, right? It's his spirit that brings the power, uh, and you don't need to have an answer for every philosophical question that uh, anyone is posing. I got tripped by, up by that this week. This is one of my regular problems, I confess to you. It's hard for me when I get out and I find myself with someone, again, has no inkling about church stuff. And there I am talking with them. And they make a statement like this. One gentleman made this week, and we were talking. He, he, gets, he gets that I'm a pastor, and he said, you know, what about all this evil in the world? And why is this evil? Why, why could people do that to other human beings? And I, I, was, I was silent for like 30 seconds. Why? Because I was ready to kick it into my, into my seminary prof speech, you know. The cause of human evil resides in the fact that I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's where my thoughts went. I thought, oh my gosh, this guy doesn't even know what the, what the word redemption means. He doesn't know. I, I just sat there. And the Lord convicted me. You know, in the sense, it just came over me as I, as, after I left the conversation. I mean, I eventually did say something, by the way, but just I left there feeling like, my goodness, uh, I'm just, I'm not in, uh, I'm not used to being in this place. What I should have done was asked him questions. Well, what have you thought is the cause of problems in the world? And let him flesh that out and then give some thoughts about it. And where have you turned when you felt like this is something that's insurmountable? And, you know, so... Don't feel like you need to have an answer for everything. But believe and trust that you are involved in something that is hugely important, that's massive, and that God is the one who is the chief missionary, and he is planning to save people. He knows who they are. He just uses people like you and me. Uh, we, are meant, we are not meant to be end users of God's grace, you know. It stops with you. <laughs> no, you're meant to pass it on. And you need to see yourself in that as someone who is in a chain of passing on the saving message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Years ago, we went to San Quintin, Mexico to help Pablo and their church down there to build a, uh, an educational wing added on to the church facility down there. And we, on this trip, we were laying a foundation and uh, there's no big cement truck that they had. It was people stirring cement. And then uh, as one group is stirring and it gets ready, they'd get a bucket load. And, and that person would hand it to the next person. That bucket would go to the next person, the next person, the next person. We had this bucket chain, bucket chain. Everybody would grab that bucket and hand it to the next person. And you knew what your place was, which was what? Grab the bucket, hand it to the next guy. That's all you got to do. And when it gets to the last person, we were laying that foundation. You are in a spiritual chain that goes back to Christ and to the time of the apostles. And what we do is what we pass on something that is utterly priceless, amazingly valuable. What is it? The message of life. There is no other name under heaven by which anyone can be saved. No other name but the name of Jesus. And so that's our place, beloved, passing that on. And what takes us there, what, what helps us overcome our timidity is seeing the value, seeing what's at stake, knowing that God is with us, knowing that God has already demonstrated his love for sinners like these people that you're talking to. Now, I'd like to end our time then reflecting on something else that Tim Keller said in regards to mission, being that this, his mission is over. He said, to be in mission is to ally yourself with a force that you know can make a difference against the misery and brokenness of the world. You're not a person on mission unless you have two things, to live for a cause more important than yourself 
and to ally yourself, connect yourself with a force more powerful than yourself that can make a difference in the world, you say. To sacrifice for a higher cause and to make a difference in the world. That is mission, he said. He goes on to talk about the error it is to live for less, to not live on mission. He said, for example, if you're living basically for a better career, for a nicer home, for a sharp spouse, you're not a person in mission because you're not living for anything more important than your own needs. <laughs> you're living to fulfill your own needs. And even if you accomplish that, and may it be, God bless you that you would, even if you accomplish that, if that is your goal in life, you know that's not going to make a difference in the world. So you got your car. So what? What's that doing in this world? And one day you move on, and there goes your car, and it rusts. So what? You see, It doesn't make a difference in the world. He says, as a result, you wonder why there's emptiness in your life. It's because every human being needs to live for mission. And as the years go by, you realize that. You realize that. And it gets more and more evident. So, beloved, what are you living for? Will it make a difference in this world? There's one thing that will make an eternal difference, and that is bringing Christ, the good news of Christ, to others. Or simply being true to being salt and light where you live, where you work. Just be true. And, and, and you can't help but be different <laughs> if you're true to Christ. May the Lord impress this on our hearts and we leave this reflection on our purpose statement. We, this is a theme, though, we need to be working out and fleshing out over, over the months ahead. Now remember, if your heart was pricked, if I were to ask you, when was the last time? When was the last time? Can you remember the last time you at least, you know, you, you stumbled, but you tried to communicate the good news? And you feel a sense of shame. Let that bring you back to the Lord's Supper, to Christ, and know that your sins are forgiven you. He is ready and willing to receive you, embrace you, empower you, and help you move on in the Christian life. Let's just be authentic with the Lord. So we'll take time to talk to him here as we prepare for communion in a moment. Right now, let me pray, and then we'll sing a song of adoration. Lord, we want to magnify your name. We want to live on mission. You know that we stumble our way through life. You know that each of us, Lord, finds some room in our heart, Lord, for improvement. Uh, well, we pray that you and your mercy and your grace would grant us greater power, that you and your mercy and your grace would grant us the working of your Holy Spirit, that you would draw near to us and give us a sense, Lord, of calling, give us a sense, Lord, of purpose, a sense of confidence that you are involving us, Lord, in something glorious, and that you've given us your Holy Spirit, Lord, to bring about, Lord, what your will is. Bring things to fruition, we pray, for your sake and in your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.